Mutual, the network for news, takes you now to London, England for Radio Newsreel, one of the world's outstanding documentary news programs presented through the cooperation of British Broadcasting Corporation. The material heard during these reports is gathered, prepared, and presented by the foreign and domestic staffs of the BBC. We invite you to join us now for Radio Newsreel. Go ahead, London. This is London calling. The British Broadcasting Corporation presents... Radio Newsreel. Every night at this time, we bring you the voices and stories of the men and women who make the news of a world at war. Tonight... We bring you the sound of battle in France. Eight Lieutenant Alan Melville broadcast during a paratroop on your drill from London. Yesterday, we brought you the first broadcast from the forties with our paratroops and gliders behind the enemy line. Tonight, we continue the story with paratroops in action and bring you the actual sound of war. Flight Lieutenant Alan Melville was present when reinforcements of paratroops at a critical stage of a battle. As he was broadcasting, a panzer battle was raging. The situation was critical, and the paratroops were coming down just in time. This is Alan Melville speaking from France. Uh, showering in, there's not a word for it. Pouring in, in trees and pause, and they're fluttering down in perfect formation, just the way we've seen it on the on the news reel, the way we've seen it done in exercises, and here they're doing it. Okay, and believe me, they haven't come any too late. There will be a very unpleasant surprise to the enemy who's fighting. I can still see the signs of a typical panzer battle. You can hear the aircraft roaring over me, I expect, as I speak. I can still see the signs of a typical panzer battle being raised on the slightly high ground just about three or four miles ahead of me. And these paratroops are coming down between where I'm speaking, which is just about the sand dunes. Down they come. They're being uh, attacked pretty, pretty fast as you hear. But they're landing in great force between the sand dunes, the beach area, and the battle. And they may have a very decisive effect on that battle. Billy is putting up everything he's got to try and save this uh, supply eventuality off, but he isn't able to go. The aircraft are sweeping in man. Letting go their valuable cargo, sweeping down as if nothing mattered, and tearing again out to sea. And they're still coming in. I'm just turning around to look out to sea, and I can see the way out to the very horizon. They're coming in in without a flood. Thank you, Alan Melville. The sounds of battle and press are going clearer to us. The first upsurge of excitement is over, and we're learning a new perspective. There's progress. But there's also the cost. There is a building of our strength inland from the beaches. But there is also a gathering of the enemy's strength. At times, wind and weather have been against us. Storms are hampering our air operations. But we're doggedly overcoming all obstacles. Those obstacles are more formidable than any army has tackled before. The German West Wall is a hard reality. Just listen to this dispatch from BBC observer Robert Barr, whose information comes from first-hand evidence. Robert Barr is speaking from an advanced Allied command post. Any suggestion that the West Wall was a myth, or that it was largely a bluff, is wrong. It's wrong by our battle reports, and it's wrong by the stories of the wounded who fell in breaching it. The part of the French coast on which our troops landed and fought their way inland was a good sample of the West Wall. Prior to operations, it is true to say that you could not have put a pin down on any part of that coast which was not under direct fire from machine guns and mortars or under fire from heavy guns. The wall was breached by bombardment by the Allied navy and airsies and it was cleaned up by the soldiers who went ashore under fire. The Germans knew that no fortifications, however strong, could stop a deterrent assault 
concentrated on one sector of the coast. The west wall was to slow down the occupation of the beaches and therefore to slow down the build-up so that his own build-up of troops in that area would be faster than ours. Then he could meet us in the field with superior forces and drive our army back into the sea. That, broadly speaking, was the meaning of the repeated boast to drive us into the sea. And just last winter, Rommel infected the sea defenses which we have breached along the Normandy coast. And some of the emplacements on this coastal strip were rebuilt this year. There were minefields around the strong point anti-tank pits and anti-personal areas between strong points, and low-lying ground was flooded. Battle reports ton of our soldiers wading waist-deep through flooded fields. Now, that was the sector of the West Wall which our troops faced on the Normandy coast. The Navy and the Air Force breached it. Assault engineers blasted away through what was left, and our ground troops went ashore and cleaned it up, and got a foothold and prepared the beaches for the Battle of the Builder. That Battle of the Builder, mentioned by Robert Barr, is now going on night and day. But the German West Wall in that area is shattered. It was shattered by the weight of Allied bombs and naval guns. And we bring you now a first-hand account of that habit, spoken as he stood among it by BBC war reporter Michael Standing. The signs of battle were around us everywhere. Landing craft lying wrecked in the shallows, a Bren carrier twisted and broken beside them, beach obstacles hit down by piled together by bulldozers, quick gaps blasted in the fellow concrete wall, the Atlantic wall, mine craters, bomb craters, shower holes. The evidence of the weight and accuracy of the bombardment was astounding. And not a house or building along the front damaged. Some were flattened altogether. There were sappers with pneumatic drills breaking up the sea wall, while only a few yards away, other sappers were exploding the remaining landmines that kept going off with resounding bangs. A few yards further, and there was a shattered German pillbox. One, we were told, that held its fire until the landing craft touched down in front of it, and then poured bullets into them at point blank range. More men, more guns, more ammunition are moving through these captured beaches to our foreign land. But not all the ships that take them get away, even though the troops are landed. Here's just one story told by a British sub-lieutenant, Patrick Hope. I was asking one of my gunners to down the ranch spot and held him securely at the bottom to let it get down more easily. The last troop had Left the ship, they dashed up, and they told me that I was first loads of bombs. When I got on board, I saw my top suit coming towards me with a bundle of clothes around me warm. He said, you better collect your gear, sir. The ship's sinking. And I found that we had a stake through the bottom of the ship. This is right through. It's sent to stand on it. The bridges, the Olympics, and the water were all flooded waist high. Went down to collect what gear I could. And with our gear on the upper deck, we stayed there all day. In the evening, we were taken out to one of the transports, anchored off three miles off the coast. We were there now, ready for another, perhaps another job to do. That was an officer of the Royal Navy. Another ship, another job to do. That's the mood of men in France today. Wherever the need is greatest, more men are rushed to the scene of action. Yesterday, you heard BBC war reporter Chester Wilmot broadcasting from a glider that had landed in France. The first wave riders was not strong enough. More had to follow. And tonight, Chester Wilmot continues the story. This time, he's speaking from the ground as the reinforcements fly in. You will hear German attack batteries opening up on them. The Germans were on three sides of the landing ground. And shells are bursting close to where Chester Wilmot is standing. Here is his broadcast. <laughs> Chester Wilmot, broadcasting from an allied strong force somewhere in France. The airborne forces which landed in France last night are being reinforced at the moment 
It's just about nine o'clock, and the whole mass of gliders has just come in, having been towed across the channel from Britain. They've received a particularly severe welcome from the German Hackett defenses, and the flak has been going up from all around us, because they're hand in on two or three sides here. It's so far as I've seen, no glider has been hit, and all the tug planes have managed to drop their loads and turn the safety away. But having failed to crack the gliders of the flak, the Germans have now begun to chill the landing zone, the rust cloud trap, where the gliders are coming into land. A lot of their shells have been falling short and landing in and around this building from which I'm speaking. But so far, uh, as far as I know, none have been landing up near the landing zone, whereas the last of the gliders are now banking around and coming in to touch down. Above, there are the fleet of Spitfires and the Thunderbolts that have been protecting the gliders and their tugs in the third cross channel concert. That was another enemy shell landing a little bit further away from here and landing, I think, very near the landing zone where the gliders are coming down now. I can see about four or five coming in through the trees, skimming very low over the flood field and coming into touch down. There'll barely be room for them to get down there because the Germans have started the whole field with the poles. And last night, a large number of gliders came down there, and many of them crashed on hitting the poles or passing over the rough ground. That also was a burst of back act, so far as I can see, and a pretty mighty burst, too. The guns burst right above it. Or one of the shells then. Done, as the ACAC rises to a new and greater fury. Thank you, Chester Wilma. And so the build-up of our troops in France continues. And in spite of all the enemy can do, and in spite of the weather, the Allied grip on Normandy is firm. And so until 24 hours from now, the BBC's radio newsreel says good night from London, England. <laughs>